All right, everyone, welcome. Y'all go ahead and find a seat if you don't already have one. And while everyone is grabbing a seat here in the room, I just wanna give a warm welcome and thank you to all of those of you tuning in. We have well over close to 120 or so that are tuning in virtually. So um, this is sort of one of those interesting hybrid events, the first time kind of trying this on the road. So know that you're all wonderful guinea pigs um, being part of this process and we're excited to get to know you tonight. So for those that I haven't met individually, my name's Mandy McGuire. I'm an Associate Director of Admission at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. I've been there um, for about six years now, so hopefully I can give some good information when we get more to the admissions um, part of this evening. Um, but again, we want to welcome all of you on the Zoom as well. I will actually act as your uh, question asker on your behalf. So please use the Q&A box at any point that you have questions. Um, and I will be happy to uh, chime in and help that become interactive here in the room. So just use that Q&A box and we'll be good to go. Obviously for those here in the room tonight, um, I know Sean has a lot in store for you from the career perspective, which is what we're all here for, right? You're making this investment in yourself. What are the outcomes? What opportunities am I going to have when I think about my future career after getting my MBA? So Thank you for spending the evening with us. And I'm gonna turn it on over to Sean and then he'll have some more folks to introduce you to as the evening goes on. Oh, all right, good to go. Hi everyone, uh, let me move that just a bit. Uh, good evening, thanks for, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for being on the live stream tonight. We're, uh, we're really excited to be here with you today. Um, typically when we go on the road, uh, we give a pretty canned presentation about who we are and what we do and uh, you know, career opportunities that await you. And frankly, um, there's not a ton of differentiation between what we would say and what Darden would say and what Stern would say or what, you know, some of the local MBA programs that maybe you've heard of might say. Um, so today we wanted to flip the script a little bit and, and show you more how we work with students instead of what we, we do with students. And so part of this is gonna, is gonna be based on an interactive exercise that I'm gonna walk you through to give you a taste of, of what my team's role is, how we partner with students, and how it can equip you to move on to the next milestone in the job search process. So that's what we're gonna get to. Uh, and then at the, uh, at the end of that exercise, I'm gonna bring up some of our alums and current students that have much more recently fought through that job search process than I have. And they're gonna be able to share their insights with you uh, you know, being more recently through the uh, interview process, the job negotiation process, all of that stuff. So we've got a bunch of different pieces and parts of this presentation that we'll walk you through tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with some general content around uh, making a career change. And I overheard some of the chatter as y'all were settling in here. It sounds like a number of you are, are contemplating career changes. I heard, I heard the word half pivot, so maybe there are some minor pivots, and maybe there are some pretty big changes. Um, and, and I just want to focus for a little bit on why MBA programs are such a great enabler of making those kinds of changes. And I, I thought it, it made sense at this point to, to introduce myself and tell you my story a little bit. Um, so a long, long time ago in my younger and thinner days, I was in the Air Force. That's me on the right. I was not a pilot. I was an intelligence officer, but the coolest part of my job was I got a rating that allowed me to go get 13 flight hours in the F-16. And this is, this is the proudest photo I have because it's like the only hero photo I have from my time in the Air Force. And you would never know, this is after spending two and a half hours getting violently airsick in this jet right here. So I held it together for the first time in my life for the, for the photo and then I collapsed into a, a heaping mess. Um, and I, I love my time in the Air Force. I grew up in a military household. Uh, it was kind of the just logical thing for me to do was to join as well. Uh, but after eight years, I kind of got tired of being told when I was going to go somewhere and what I was going to do and have very little agency over that process. And so for me, it was time to make a career change. And like many of you are doing right now, I started checking out MBA programs and I decided that that was the right next step for me. I enrolled in Notre Dame's MBA program and I took advantage of that opportunity to pivot my career from Air Force intelligence to brand management. <clears throat> and so I... I took an internship at Procter & Gamble, I started at Procter & Gamble, and then I spent some time at Mondelez International and Tyson Foods. And the cool thing about brand is you might not have heard of some of those companies, but I'm pretty certain you've heard of some of the brands I worked on. Charmin Bath Tissue, crowning achievement of my life as a 30-year-old first year at Procter & Gamble, man, I'm slinging toilet paper. And from there I got to move to Dentine Chewing Gum, and Sour Patch Kids Candy, and uh, Hillshire Farm Smoked Sausage. Like I saw the world of consumer goods. And it's still wild for me to consider at one point in my life 
I was literally the only person on earth with the job title, brand manager of Sour Patch Kids. So that's, and my kids, my, I now have an eight-year-old daughter, and she, like, that's what she sees me as, uh, even though that was many, many years in the, in the rear view at this point. And I loved, I loved, you know, this, this cheesy little graphic has all these different like cross-functional words, right? That's what people think about brand management. It's this cross-functional leadership. And I loved leading cross-functional teams to deliver our, our brand priorities. But what I found as I was doing the work is the most fulfilling part of my job was when I got to work with my junior marketers, when we'd hire them fresh from MBA programs. And I'd sit down with them and sketch out what their careers were going to look like. What are these next steps going to be? Um, and even on a fairly big job, I had five or six direct reports, and so that was a, a tiny fraction of my work. And so I decided it's time to pivot again, and that's what led me to higher ed. At that point, I thought, man, if I could go to an MBA program, I could, I could help hundreds of people plot out their career objectives and, and achieve them on an annual basis, and, and I could do that all the time. And so I went back to my alma mater. I was at Notre Dame for three years, and then about four and a half years ago, I jumped over here to Duke. So I've been coaching MBA students all in for about seven years, and I love what I do. It's so awesome, especially at this age and stage of y'all's lives, uh, to have even a 1% impact on, on what you're going to achieve moving forward. That, that's just really fulfilling work. So this relates to the content because not only did I leverage my time in an MBA program to pivot careers pretty dramatically, um, but I did it again later. And, and that's the one thing we really focus on in the Career Management Center at Fuqua. Our job isn't to help you get one great internship that leads to one great job. Our job is to give you a, a repeatable skill set that allows you to pivot over and over and over again for the remainder of your career. And based on average ages, when we get into an MBA program after you graduate, you still got like 25, 30 years of work in front of you, right? So to be able to leverage this process and continually pivot is really important. And so we spend a lot of time building lifelong skills. It obviously helps up front for that first job, but it, hopefully it's something you can fall back on for the duration of your career. I probably don't need to define career change to the people in this room or on the live stream, but what we're talking about here is either changing industries, changing functions, or both. Um, either, either of these definitions uh, would work, and we know that an MBA is a great enabler of this. Plenty has been written about the power of MBA programs uh, for people looking to change careers, and y'all have probably read some of this stuff. Um, there are some stats out there. So US News says two-thirds or more of graduating MBAs are career changers. Transparent Career says 80%. GMAC, that runs the, the vaunted GMAT test, uh, they say it's 59%. Pick your metric. What I'm going to tell you is that a majority of people that go to full-time MBA programs use it to change careers. And at Fuqua, over the past several years, we're closer to that 80% number than the other numbers on the screen. So this absolutely is happening on a regular basis at Fuqua as well. So why? Why are MBA programs so conducive? So believe it or not, um, one, of those, one of the benefits is that you have time to think. Now, I think what our students and our alums will tell you is not as much time as you think, because life moves pretty quickly in an MBA program. But you still, your purpose for those two years is to really reset the career side of things. And that's hard to do when you're balancing you know, a real job and a real life um, while, while trying to dive deep into what you want to do next. And so we, we allow you to carve out some time to think about where you want to go. Through your academic curriculum, experiential learning opportunities, club programming, you're, you're constantly gaining knowledge and you're building new skills. And these, these things are very appealing to potential employers. Uh, you're exposed to new opportunities. I think this is the big one. Um, maybe, maybe if I, you know, after this presentation, you would tell me you know exactly what you want to do after school. And if that's correct, kudos to you. I would still challenge you to pressure test that once you get to school and make sure. Now, if you don't have any idea, that's what makes this so awesome. You know, over a couple of years, exposed to literally hundreds of opportunities with employers. You get to actually meet people who can tell you about what they do. Many of these things you might not uh, have known ever existed beforehand. Um, there's another cool stat that I didn't put on the, the previous slide. The GMAC says two in five MBA grads ultimately land in a job they had not considered before enrolling in the MBA program. So that's a pretty powerful exposure device. Um, and then finally, the summer internship is huge. You get a chance to test drive a job, maybe for the only time in your life, where you can be a consultant for 10 weeks just to see how it works, or a brand manager for 10 weeks. Um, so to be able to, to try that out, it, it lowers the, 
the stress level for the employer. They're more willing to take a risk on a career changer to see if this works out because there's not that long-term commitment. And for you, it's an awesome opportunity to test a hypothesis. I think consulting is right for me. Let's try it on. Uh-oh, it's not. Or confirm that hypothesis. This is absolutely perfect and you feel good about that. So these are benefits that, that you're granted by enrolling in an MBA program. But the truth is, the foundation of that is you walk in the door uh, as highly uh, sought after candidates from our partner employers from day one. Uh, you have more raw materials than you may, maybe realize. You have more relevant experience and transferable skills than you might realize. Um, and so again, I think our role is more refining those things than building you from, from scratch, right? And so, um, there, and, and the, the increase in early recruiting kind of suggests this, right? Like, hey, I, I, I know what I'm getting out of these MBA students and, and I'm, I'm okay as an employer to start that process a little bit earlier because I have confidence in the skills you bring in the door. So um, you're starting off in a really good point as is. So um, just some students that, that I've worked with since I joined four years ago. I worked with a consultant turned product manager. You would probably look at that and say, ah, oh, that's a fairly tr you know, traditional career change in an MBA program. Um, an engineer turned investment banker. OK, these, these are pretty normal things. But I also worked with a high school teacher who is now a consultant at McKinsey and Company. Uh, a professional volleyball player who, like me, pursued a, a path in brand management and is now at PepsiCo. And finally, a US Army medic. Uh, who served all kinds of time in Afghanistan and Iraq, who is now in Davida's world-class general management leadership development program. Um, and so, you know, I, I've kind of started with maybe some, some near-in uh, pivots to some pretty dramatic pivots. And I would love to say that's because of, of me and my team, and it's really not. It's more because of these people and who they are, uh, and they eventually figured out how to go through the job search process uh, and effectively land um, the, the roles they were looking for. So hopefully I've convinced you that there are lots of tasty opportunities out there. I would say the CMC's job is to help you then seize those opportunities. You can see that they're out there. We're here to provide some structure, some support along the way uh, so that you can seize the opportunities that are most appealing to you. Uh, and I think that's gonna bring me to, uh, to my team and just our guiding philosophy. And I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, this all starts from a point of, of believing that everyone in our program deserves meaningful work. And, and finding meaningful work is what drives most people back to, to an MBA program in the first place. It's not our job to define meaningful. We're, we have no vested interest to push you towards consulting or banking or technology or anything else. If it's meaningful to you, it's meaningful to us, and we're gonna partner with you to help you achieve that. Our process is, is fairly simple. I'm gonna walk you through the five steps that we get in front of students and, and you know, try to, to, to to beat the, the drum for over and over again through our curriculum. Um, but, but this process by which you're gonna go from where you are today to where you wanna go, uh, it starts with knowing who you are. Um, understanding that, that you have talents that are sought after. So you, you were born with some inherent talents that have enabled you to add value consistently to organizations you've been a part of your whole life. Whether we're talking about you know, growing up in school, sports teams, college, your, your career, some of these things are just inherently within you. We help you figure out what those things are. And once you've figured out what those things are, we've got a tool that helps you figure out how those things have allowed you to, to drive results in the past. And those things that you've done in the past are likely gonna be repeatable in the future to add more value to more organizations. Um, and this is the starting point though. You've gotta walk in and say, I've got something to offer. Um, you can believe me when I say it, but I need you to believe it in yourself when you're in front of employers. So that's where we start. So now you know what you're good at. Now you have to figure out where you want to point yourself. Where do you want to go? Um, and so maybe you know a lot about MBA career paths. Great. You're, you're off to a little bit of a head start. If you don't know anything, we're here to help. That's what we work with all these employers, to, to teach you about these career paths. And over time, you're gonna to start to figure out which of these paths or which path is best for you. You're gonna lock into that. And once you've got a path figured out, You've got to figure out which employers are most interesting to you, given your priorities. They could be geographic. They could be based on a function or an industry. Um, but, but this is where we start to figure out the, the direction you're going to take for the rest of this process. And then it gets a little more tactical from there. Communicate your values. So you've got to be able to construct a good resume. Um, you've got to be able to deliver a concise pitch when you're meeting people. And finally, you've got to be able to write a persuasive cover letter. These are all fairly easy things to teach, especially once you know who you are and where you want to go. The, the truth is, you know, those first three steps are kind of table stakes. 
and writing the greatest resume and cover letter on earth and being able to effectively pitch yourself uh, to people who come to you usually isn't enough to really gain traction where you want to go. So this is where my team spends most of our time. How are we doing in terms of building advocacy? And what we mean by that is how are you uh, doing in terms of taking total strangers and turning them into people who behind the scenes in their organization are fighting for you to get through that door? And that's a pretty systemat systematic process. It starts with, first we gotta reach out to people and we gotta reach out to them in a way that's gonna attract responses and appeal to their willingness to help me. And then from there, I've gotta be able to, to make a good first impression, primarily using small talk, and then I've probably gotta manage a much longer conversation with them. And that conversation is meant to start, you know, talking to a strange person and 30 minutes in, maybe uh, having them trust you enough that when you say, hey, would you refer me for this position, they say yes. Because if that's the first question you ask on the phone call, I know where that's gonna go, right? But you can build trust with somebody in a fairly short amount of time, and we've got some recipes to help you do that. And finally, good thank you notes are again kind of table stakes. So this is our bread and butter. We spend a ton of time uh, focused on this, and a lot of this, if you wanted to see kind of what drives our philosophy on this, there's a book called The Two Hour Job Search that, that kind of drives a, a lot of this structure, and it's a really easy read. Um, and the, the guy who wrote it, I think the cool thing is the guy who wrote it sits four hours down from me. He's one of our career coaches. And this book is now taught at all the schools you've heard of. Um, and I've learned a ton from being able to go down to Steve's office and pick his brain after tens of thousands of iterations working with students to put this in practice. Um, but, but my benefit doesn't matter as much as the benefit our students receive having such e uh, easy access to the guy who literally wrote the book um, that most MBA students are using to, to build advocacy. And finally, then you get in the room and it's time to dominate the interview. Uh, and the, the school is loaded with resources to help you do that. In many cases, our students, our alums, are driving those, uh, those programs forward to make sure you're ready to go. So um, this is our process. Uh, I once had a boss tell me, um, you know, there's a difference between simple and easy. So this is a simple process. I can put five little diagonal boxes up here and tell you, just do these five things. Um, his analogy was golf. Golf is a simple sport, right? Put this little white ball in that hole, that's it. That's the whole sport. But golf will humble people who play it very quickly, right? And so can the career search. It can be a humbling experience. So you gotta be ready to put the work in. But you put the work in and you do the right things at the right time, I am certain this will drive predictable results. We've seen it just over and over again. Um, and of course, when you can add in the fact that we've worked with hundreds of employers to establish uh, long-term relationships, we've got awesome alumni who are invested in your success, um, and our clubs are incredible and, and drive this process forward for, for most of our first years, it's a pretty incredible starting point. And then finally, all of that is buoyed by our team of career coaches. So we got 10 full-time MBA career coaches, um, we all have a specialized area of focus. I'm consumer goods, retail, and automotive. We've got coaches focused on the traditional paths like consulting and finance and technology. And we've got coaches focused on things like energy and social impact uh, and media entertainment and sports. Um, and so in terms of staffing and resources, we're rich. You know, we've got somebody dedicated to spend as much time on media entertainment and sports as we do in consulting. I don't think you're gonna see that at a lot of uh, uh, schools. Um, but but this, is, this is who we are and what we do. We work to drive the students forward through that process to unlock the results they're looking for. So I'm gonna pause there. Before we get into any of the interactive exercise, and I just wanna give a chance uh, for y'all to ask any questions about what I presented, our team structure. Pause for the live stream if there's any questions there. Um, but I'll take a quick break here to see if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. No pressure. All right, let's keep it moving then. So I think the, the easiest way to distill what I do as a career coach, what we do as a team of career coaches is this. We help students navigate challenging situations. First timers going through this process don't know the danger lurking behind that next turn, right? But we've seen it over and over again. So if we don't find a way to tell you in advance, hey, this is something tricky and here's an approach to weather it, then we're not serving you correctly. Um, so that's what we do, and I'm gonna use this very cheesy graphic of a road. And look, there are all kinds of things that can derail somebody driving on this road, and all these things are very scary. The elevator pitch, talking to strangers, coffee chats, writing a cover letter, informational meetings. The first time you go through a lot of these things, they are terrifying. And if you had to do them all by yourself with no support, that would probably not lead to great outcomes. 
But our job is to focus in one at a time on all of these potential pain points and find a way for you to effectively get through that process with as little resource investment as possible so you've still got energy for the next phase. So it's kind of like a, a minimum viable product, right? Like how do I get the most, uh, most out of something with the least investment into it and just on to the next phase? Sorry, man, did you say there was a question? Yeah, hopefully I can pick this up. I was just gonna say, it's a very quick one. Um, does the CMC support you beyond your time at Fuqua? Oh, good question. Yes, you have lifetime uh, support from the CMC as a Fuqua graduate. We've got a team of dedicated alumni career coaches, but a lot of alums that we've worked with will continue to work with us just because we've got established relationships. But yes, we're there for you for the long term. So these are the potential road hazards that we're gonna try and, uh, and avoid. And so this is where I wanna show you kinda of how we do what we do. And, and so I'm gonna go through a live example here focused on the, the, this prospect of an elevator pitch. Has everyone heard of elevator pitch? Yeah, okay. I, seven years coaching a student, I've never heard of it happening in an elevator. I don't know why we can't move away from this elevator pitch idea, but we still call it this elevator pitch and it generally um, creates some, some uh, emotions in people, right? This prospect of an elevator pitch. So. Um, one of the things that I did not tell y'all is uh, the word of the day is flexibility. We've had to adapt to uh, changing flight schedules and uh, some, some issues with the hotel and, and also some tech issues. So this isn't gonna be as clean as I'd hoped, but uh, I am gonna have, I'm gonna start with a couple of, of quick polls. Um, and so for those, and I have different links for those here in the room with us and for those on Zoom. And so uh, what I've got are these slido.com, so grab your phone, um, you can see the codes to enter when you get there based on your location. Uh, and I'm gonna activate these two polls in one moment. Um, before I activate the polls, and I'll give you a minute here to log in. And, and once you're in and you, you actually see the right screen, if you could just give me a thumbs up, that would be awesome. Okay, so somebody's in there. Not yet. I didn't want to spoil it. All right, so um, I'm going to set the scene here. What if I told you uh, in this room, through those double doors right there, are representatives from the top 10 employer targets you hope to work for in your life? And right now, you have to get up, walk through those doors, and pitch yourself for 30 seconds. All right, that's the scene I'm setting here. So total surprise. Rock stars are out there, you need to go uh, pitch yourself to them. I'm gonna activate the poll. I wanna know how the prospect of that makes you feel and you will see the options in the poll here. And I need to activate them both separately. Is your guys activated yet? Okay, here you go. You should now see a poll. Okay. So for, for here in the room, I have about 13% that say that sounds pretty awful. Uh, I've only got 25% that says that's amazing and everybody else is kind of somewhere in between. I would say that makes you pretty normal human beings. Uh, for those on the live stream, only 10% say that sounds awful but only 19% say it sounds amazing, and so it looks like the vast majority of people participating in this process are somewhere in between, and I think that's fairly uh, reasonable. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not something that many people would, would do voluntarily in their free time, right? Um, it's usually something that comes more out of obligation, and uh, if I were taking this poll, when I was in your shoes, I definitely would have chosen the, ugh, that sounds awful uh, option, even as a career coach. Okay, so I'm gonna ask another question here, and I, we're not gonna be able to get the results here. Um, that was kind of presented to you as a surprise. My question is, if when you registered for this event, I told you that you were gonna have to pitch yourself to 10 of your target employers, my question is, how long would you spend preparing your pitch? So let me activate that question. And y'all can answer that here. Okay. 
Okay, so here locally, the winning response is more than an hour. And uh, the, the least popular response is under 10 minutes. And on the live stream, strong 63% uh, more than an hour, only 3% under 10 minutes. So uh, the, the majority uh, response here is you spend more than an hour preparing this pitch. That's 30 seconds, right? So that's kind of crazy. And these are things that as a career coach drive me nuts, right? Like why are we spending an hour on something that takes 30 seconds? Can we fix this? Can we do something uh, that, that makes that a little bit easier? Okay, so thank you for participating in the polls. Um, and now I, I would love, so um, maybe some of the Q&A can come in from the live stream. But for people who, who think this is an amazing thing, people who answered, yay, this is amazing, I'd love to hear, like, why? What, what makes it amazing? Or even if you're somewhere in between and you lean more towards amazing, I'd love to hear why you enjoy this activity. What's so good about it? Yes? I feel like it's a kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to have the, the opportunity to present in front of 10 people that you desire to work at, okay. 10 companies you desire to work at. <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, it's, it's a little scary to do that, and you're putting everything on the line. Right? Yeah. So it's kind of high risk, high reward. Okay. So there's like an adrenaline rush associated with what an opportunity. Okay, yeah. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is they say no. And okay. you have to go through all 10. By the time you get to the 10th, you feel pretty confident. So. All right, this is, so this, I love hearing this, right? This is about testing and learning. If I'm going to fail, let me fail now and let me build better and do that quickly. And I got 10 chances out there. By iteration number 10, I'm going to be good to go. Okay, so there's some embracing of, hey, let's get this process started. Okay, other thoughts on like what makes this a fun thing? Because this is foreign to me. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you two uh, that, that answered, at least you lean more towards this is fun. Have, have you ever been told that you're naturally charming? Are you good at making first impressions? Yeah. Like you're smiling, yeah? I think I'm just a little competitive and I love it. Okay, <laughs> okay. I love like going in there and being like, all right, it's game time. Let's yeah. Go, you know? So what are the things, I don't know, have, have any of y'all ever taken the Clifton Strengths assessment? <clears throat> one of, one of the, the talent themes is woo, and it's winning others over. Um, and, and that is something that a, you know, a fraction of the, the, the population on earth is just born with. And we've got like two or three of them on my coaching team and they are, they are like aliens to me. But they just can't help but walk into a room of strangers and dominate the place and come out as like everybody's favorite. So some of this is kind of inherent talent. So maybe you're just naturally charismatic, maybe this is comfortable for you, or maybe there are other things driving it like com com competitively, I'm just not gonna lose in this arena, right? And so maybe that's driving it a little bit. But in a lot of cases, the people that, that feel uh, most comfortable in this environment kind of have always been able to make friends quickly and, and been pretty charismatic uh, just naturally. Is there a question, Mandy, on the? Uh, just more people sharing their experiences. Okay. So uh, one person said, um, on Heat said it's, it's a great learning experience, and even if I fail, it'll make for an awesome story. Um, John has said, I only need one person to like me. Out of the 10 people connecting, doesn't seem scary. Uh, <laughs> You have the opportunity to talk about industries that you're passionate about. Um, and then someone else says, I agree with the alien part. Uh, I don't understand how anyone can enjoy an elevator pitch. So okay, all comments right. from the online folks. <laughs> what I like most that I'm hearing is, hey, maybe it's not going to go perfect. Uh, and let's just get into it. And I think that's the worst possible outcome is stressing out so much about it that you're not even willing to enter the arena. Um, so, so good, I'm, I'm hearing some good things here. Now, of course, I wanna hear next from these people, like, oh man, I don't wanna do this at all. Um, so for those that said, UG, if, if you're willing to reveal yourselves, or if you just lean more towards UG, why is this feel so uncomfortable? Yeah. I could start. I think I said somewhere in the middle, but I think my hesitancy is like having right now not really done that before, like having only gone through the undergrad kind of recruiting process and not done the like pitch to employers in real world so yeah. for like a second job. So there's a lack of repetition, yeah. right? You just haven't done this a lot before, so that's that's uh, foreign. Other other reasons why this why this pitching thing just doesn't doesn't sound awesome. It just seems like you're going to be stressed out. You're going to have like a lot of work ahead of you in like a very concentrated amount of time. And it just seems like there's a lot in front of you. Too. Yeah. Stressful. But what drives the stress? Why? 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 Fear of failure. Fear of failure. Okay. 
But, but what, um, what does winning in this environment sound like? Like, what is winning? Uh, getting a great job okay. in this situation. Okay. Now, can you get a great job in 30 seconds? Right? It's not, you're not usually winning the job in these 30 seconds, right? But if you tank those 30 seconds, it might seal your fate, right? It might end the process there. So that's, that's what some of the stress is. Um, what about the words you say when you're giving a pitch? Do those feel comfortable? Not necessarily. To you, they do. So you said not necessarily. So tell me more about that. I think it matters the context of the situation. Because when you first said that, I thought you meant like we would one one on one go out there and we pitch to all 10 people at once. That to me sounds horrible. Okay. Because you don't know how to focus in on someone yeah. and maybe like make more of a connection. Okay. But if it was a one on one process where you go through mm -hmm. one by one all 10 people, I think that for me would be a lot more comfortable. Um, but with the words, I think sometimes it's hard to talk about yourself. Not to stereotype, but I think like especially as women, um, maybe especially in industries where it's predominantly male, sometimes it's awkward or uncomfortable to so like advocate yourself and talk yourself yeah. up. Yeah, th there's a lot of insight. Why does the context matter? You said there's not context if I'm out there talking to 10 people. Meaning like, does it mean we're walking out there and talking to all 10 people at once? Like, is that the situation? Sure, or what is it, it is? I think that would be more scary for me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm moving from being scared to on the other side now. Okay. The main reason for me not liking it is it's hard to build that rapport. I like to connect with people on that personal level first. But, but now I realize, um, <laughs> you know, we jump right into the, I guess, networking and job piece. Yeah. And I'm missing kind of the um, piece where you actually get to like build that connection. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It, it feels, so what I'm hearing is like, whoa, 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 what about the personal connection here? This is kind of feeling inauthentic or generic or forced or whatever. Okay, good. There, there, thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for sharing your, your thoughts. Mandy, is anything else coming from the live stream? Yeah, actually lots of people have similar comments. <laughs> uh, too much pressure. Definitely will be super awkward and nervous. Fear about the reaction of a potential employer. I think it's talking about myself or trying to sell myself that just feels uncomfortable. Yes. Um, someone else just says simple stress. With 10 possible dream companies, how many biases do you need to consider? So that's, I guess, a little bit more of a yeah. question. Based on possible employers, how do you need to craft your pitch based on sector, mission statements, etc.? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're getting into some good stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> how am I going to, so I got selling myself, I got tailoring my words, the mission statements. Ugh, doesn't that, doesn't that sound just awful? Um, doesn't that lead to, uh, hi, I'm Sean. I'm a results-oriented, analytical, collaborative leader with a track record of delivering results in high-pressure environments. I mean, we've seen that on LinkedIn summaries, right? Usually in all caps, right? Like, that's who I am. And I don't, that, none of that means anything to me. There is no personal connection. You're selling me stuff, like using these words that I might not even be looking for. And it's because many people believe that is the task, sell. And how do you sell to someone you've never met? There's no personal connection. So you're like, we've all probably had door-to-door -door salesmen come to our houses, right? And they just start selling it. I don't want that. So get out. Like, and that can be the response if you go into sales mode in these things. And so, it, but, but how many of you have been told at some point, you're going to an MBA program, get ready to sell yourself, Everybody's been told to sell themselves. It's terrible advice. Um, because really what we're looking for in 30 seconds is more the personal connection piece. Because you cannot win a job in 30 seconds. Maybe you can lose it. But these 30 seconds spark a first impression that leads to five more minutes, that leads to 10 more minutes, that leads to an interview. And then you're going to get actual questions meant to gauge qualifications for a role. You start trying to ram qualifications into a pitch, it gets ugly really quickly, right? And so what I would say is these words all, um, typically when I ask like, when you see a bad pitch happening, what does it mean? It's inauthentic. That person is saying words that don't even seem true to them. They're, they're very buzzwordy. I, I don't understand it. Illogical is what I want to focus. There's no coherent story here. They're just throwing stuff at me, hoping something is going to land, but I don't understand what drove that person's decisions and why they're here. They're boring. You know, they're just repeatable. I've, I've stood, I've done 
uh, workshops where we would just have MBAs step up to a coach and pitch and then one after the other. And after the third pitch, they all sound identical because they're listening to each other and trying, oh, that results-oriented thing, that sounds good, right? Let's not do that. And, and what that leads to is they're forgettable. They end up being forgettable three minutes after the person has left me. Uh, I've forgotten what they said. So my, my take is, especially when I think about the stress related to this and how many of these are bad and the investment over an hour to get to a place that we don't even like, that sucks, right? And so our, our point from the CMC is, what if I could help you build a pitch that is authentic, it is logical, it, it involves positive energy, and therefore it is memorable, and we can do it in under 10 minutes. Does that sound like something that would be of interest to you? Okay, I hope so. Now, um, before I unveil the recipe and have you guys go through this exercise, I'm, I'm curious if there is a brave volunteer that would come forward and, and maybe, maybe you qualify, you know, we'll do it either way, come on up. I was gonna say, hopefully you kind of don't like giving pitches, because I want the big reveal of, oh, this wasn't so bad. Um, but um, I'm gonna grab the handheld mic if I could. <clears throat> no, you were having a facilitated interview with me, the career coach, all right? All right. All right, so first, here you go. Thank you, sir. Come on up. All right. We'll stand, you can stand on that side of the screen. All right. Uh, and let me grab a notepad to take some notes here. All right. All right, sir, what is your name? Isaiah Green. Isaiah Green. Yes, sir. Okay. Isaiah, where do you work? I work at Nike. I'm an associate product manager. Nike. Associate product manager. That's a pretty cool job. Yeah. You're going to make shoes for a living. Uh, so we're in Boston. Is that what, Converse? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, what is your favorite part of being an associate product manager at Nike? Besides making shoes for a living, I would say it's talking and engaging with other people who are just really in love with their jobs. Um, that just makes the whole thing better. Even when we're on a crunch time or deadline, we work on six seasons at once, but we all love what we're doing because we're making sneakers for a living. That's awesome. Um, I assume you also really love that stuff? Oh, yeah. I only own three pairs of shoes. I don't like buying things, but okay. I really love... Okay the idea of the sneaker culture. What is it about the organization that attracts that kind of passion? Absolutely, I think, I think at the end of the day, if, if you don't love culture, if you don't love the competition, because that's what Nike is, it's all about finding the best athletes, it's all about finding the best out of people. Um, and so that's what you get. You get the people that may have dropped out of high school, but are the best at understanding the consumer, or people that went to Harvard and are the best at understanding the consumer. Yeah. It's all just about understanding our consumers. That's awesome, man. So the way you speak about it, I, I trust that you're passionate about it. Absolutely. I'm going to assume that you are good at it. I hope, yeah. Yeah, you know. here you are. Yeah. You're, you're in the midst of potentially making a pretty dramatic change, right? You're, you're sure. maybe leaving that behind sure. to go pursue this MBA thing. Right. Why? Yeah, so I, I, I've always uh, wanted, I always thought that, you know, there's always time to wear a suit and tie there's only one time in my life that I can be 21 years old and make sneakers. Um, so I said, let me go ahead and do that now because there, there's no, it's just not as cool to be 40 and starting to make sneakers, you know what I mean? It's, it's easy. Uh, Shots be, fired. <laughs> no. I guess I'm not working for Nike. Uh, but you know, I said I wanted to do this because I know if I don't, I might regret it later. Um, and I have loved it, but I also know that I want to do more, um, okay. especially in the world of sustainability that I've been able to lean into at Nike, but definitely want to push into. Um, okay further in my career. Okay. And if this, this last question, man, is just gonna ask you to predict the future a little bit. Um, envision yourself graduated from an MBA program. What's the right. most likely kind of career path you see yourself pursuing? Absolutely, so definitely something within clean energy uh, and hopefully helping Fortune 500 companies, especially in the North America uh, region, stay ahead of regulatory policy. I know it's gonna be incredibly important for these companies come 2030 when the government actually starts to care. Um, <laughs> these companies are gonna to have to figure out how to respond really quickly and they're gonna need someone that understands both the business process and the government policies. All right, awesome. Uh, big hand for Isaiah, thanks for coming up, man. <laughs> All right, I'll just leave this. Okay, so, um, Isaiah, you didn't, you didn't know I was, I've never met Isaiah. You didn't know I was gonna ask you those questions. You didn't struggle to answer those questions at all, right? Okay, so 
uh, what I kind of walked you through are the three components of the pitch that we help students build. Um, you know, I asked you where you worked and what you did, but we've got this, this three box uh, recipe that I love. I started by asking your favorite part about work. And your eyes lit up, man, and you smiled, and you told me about working around all these other people who love what they do as much as you love what you do in this culture of competitive spirit. Um, it, was, it was just this jolt of contagious positive energy for me, right? So awesome, you nailed that. Insight gained. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, why? Why are you leaving that behind? Um, and you talked to me about wanting to do more, right? Like, there's more that I want to do. I've been exposed a little bit to the sustainability space. I want more. And then, I, and then we get to transition made, okay? So, so why are you making this transition? Uh, and you were able to give me a really good answer here. Now, if you could answer each of these questions with about 10 seconds of content and slap it all together, you've got the makings of a really good 30-second pitch, right? So like I could say, like, I'm Sean, I'm a first year MBA. Uh, before I was uh, an MBA student, I was in the Air Force, I was an intelligence officer. And I loved working with military forces from around the globe to uh, make the world a safer place. Um, but I also wanted to, to be able to take more control of my career. Um, and so I decided that enrolling in an MBA program was the right next step for me. And I'm here today to, to talk to you about a career in consumer goods, right? There's like some, there's actually a story, there's a theme to this thing. Um, and, you know, we just spent five minutes. So people are spending an hour on pitches, but we just did three questions in like five minutes, and, and I bet we could get to a pretty good starting point. So how this, this fits, is anybody else, after Isaiah talked to me, going to tell that story? It's impossible for anyone else to tell that story. So it's 100% authentic, and you're not worried about buzzwords. When you were talking to me, you were using very comfortable language, and that sparked with me in a way that the next person up, if they did a similar thing, that's gonna spark with me too. I'm not dealing in buzzwords. So only you can tell this story. It's logical, there's cause and effect. And logical is important when you tell a story because logic and, and making sound decisions builds trust. They, they establish you as somebody who's trustworthy. Hey, that person's pretty smart. They, they were exposed to that, they wanted more, they chose an MBA, that, that's smart. And if you're smart with your career, you're gonna be smart within the organization. So I trust you as a candidate a little bit more. And I've got a, a video here. This is another one on the flexible front. I'm literally going to hold this microphone up to the speaker so y'all can hear it. Um, did you recognize who was on the screen there? Those were the South Park creators, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, also the creators of Book of Mormon, um, pretty artful storytellers. They dropped in in a film class at NYU uh, to surprise these students and talk about their process. Um, it was a, it's something that aired on MTV about 10 years ago. Um, but, but I think they, they hit on the magic here. If I told you I was in the Air Force, and then I was a brand manager, and then I was a career coach, you might remember those three things, but you wouldn't have any idea how those things connect to one another. But I was in the Air Force, but I wanted more control over my life, so then I pivoted to brand management. I loved what I did in brand management, but I didn't get to spend as much time working on people's career development as I wanted, therefore, I transitioned to higher ed. Now I've got stickiness between these, these points that are very ripe for follow-on questions after I delivered this pitch. So that's the importance of cause and effect. <clears throat> Uh, positive energy. Isaiah, you mentioned, I mentioned this up front. You lit up when I asked you what you do. Uh, that's important. Up front, if you're able in these first 30 seconds, when you say the favorite, my favorite thing about this job, the other person starts to smile too. That's likable. I want to be around somebody who makes me smile. I want to spend more time with this person. And if you're going to get to the interview stage, you better hope they want to spend more time with you, right? And so that trick just up front provides that jolt of energy. And finally, that makes things memorable. These stories, story six, there's a lot of research that stories are more memorable than facts alone. We've saw, seen a, a study that puts it at six to seven times. I don't know exactly how they measured that, but I'll tell you what. If, uh, if I see Isaiah on campus in two years, I'm going to remember that story. I can't forget it now. And if you guys see him there as well, you're going to remember that. And if instead I just had him talk about you know, his three big achievements from his resume, I'd probably forget those. But the sneakerhead who wants to get into sustainability and help companies fix their, their programs, uh, when we start caring about them, like these are words that are gonna stick with me. And we did all that again in five minutes, and we could deliver a 30 second pitch based on that, right? So, um, any questions on that? So I, I did bring some, some paper, uh, I brought some handouts. Um, I would love each, like to offer you all the opportunity to uh, benefit from this as well. I'll give you a little bit of time to sketch something out. Um, here you go. 
Here, if you could pass some of these around. <clears throat> so my goal was to show you it's not that hard. I'm going to give you uh, four minutes to answer three questions. All right, so that's four minutes. Maybe not as much time as needed, but in the spirit of rapidly prototyping and, and iterating, uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and move to the next phase. What I'd like y'all to do is just huddle up in groups of two or three people and take turns sharing what you came up with here. You don't have to nail 30 seconds quite yet, but share the content uh, and then just share some feedback. What worked really well and is there one area that, that maybe would have made it a little bit better? Um, and so I'll give you four minutes to, to share uh, the pitches and share some quick feedback, all right? All right, so like as a, you know, as a career coach, one of my favorite days is when we get to do this in the classroom. There's like 80 people, and you can imagine how loud and raucous that classroom gets, but I'm looking at your faces now, and you're all smiling. Even though you didn't all say you love the idea of a pitch, so I'm curious, like, what are your reactions to this exercise? How did this go? Anybody want to share any thoughts on this process? Yeah. I think similar to what you said, this felt a lot more like authentic and just talking about experience rather than trying to like use buzzwords or like not have a lot of like physical examples. But I think this felt kind of more like grounded in like reality, which made yeah. it less daunting. Yeah, I mean our, our goal here is instead of selling yourself, how about we just start by establishing yourself as trustworthy and likable. And, and that's gonna carry you, you know, through the rest of this process. But absolutely I want and, and and even better if that makes it easier too, right? And so if it was comfortable and natural for you to, to talk in, in this language, great. Other reactions? Yeah. It was actually just kind of fun to hear what people had to say because it felt like we weren't even talking about our jobs. We were talking about the pieces of our jobs that we're passionate about. Yeah. So it's just learning more about people and learning about like, what makes people tick. Yeah, we're talking about the most interesting parts of the work, right? The stuff you liked most. I know we all have bad days at work, right? We're not talking about that stuff. And so when you only, when you can distill it to the fun stuff, uh, the, the most exciting stuff, the stuff you're most passionate about, it is. It's super interesting to hear that from other people. And, and my guess is you'll remember some of these conversations. Any other reactions? I think it's really good self-reflection. -reflect I think especially because we're potentially all in like high pressure jobs. And when you're thinking about your MBA experience, like at least for me, like I was taking the test and thinking about it so much last summer and then work has just been so crazy. Yeah. And then sometimes when you actually put pen to paper and actually think like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I dedicating time to invest in myself? It, I think it's really cool. Yeah. And we awesome. all have a lot of like shared experiences, mm -hmm. um, which even though we all probably work at very different places, like when you actually look at our sheets, like it's not super different. Yeah. And you did it in four minutes. See, this is what I love about it. I, I don't profess that after these four or five minutes, you're going to have the perfect pitch. But you're going to have at least a B plus in five minutes of work. And then you're going to be able to go interact with people and make it better from there. And so w why not do more of that? Let's get the five minute version and get out there in the market, get some feedback instead of the hour, two hour version alone in your apartment that you don't like, right? And so that's, that's what this is about. It's unlocking those types of things, but quickly. So you're on to the next phase. And so to take us back, like, cool, now we've got a solution for this one. All right, now we gotta talk about, all right, you're gonna have to start reaching out to strange people. And that's another, I'm not gonna take you through an exercise on that. But that's our job, right? On to the next. And let's do it, in, if, if we can do it in five minutes and three questions, let's do that. And then let's get here. And if we can do that in 20 minutes and one email structure, let's do that and on to the next. So that's what we spend our time focused on to make life easier for our students, all right? Okay, um, any final questions before we bring uh, alums and students up to, to tell you the real, the real deal instead of the, the paid career coach uh, message from Fuqua? Any other questions? Mandy, any questions from the live stream? Just add a couple of these were fun exercises, great exercise, very helpful. So no more questions, but okay. I've actually really enjoyed that even from afar. I mean, there's a reason I chose that one because I think it's the most fun and, you know, it's containable. And the, the most important thing, when I, when I talk to our admissions team about this event, it's not just to show you how we work uh, with our students, which is important, but let's also give them a useful tool that will help them through the application process. If you're interviewing at Fuqua, if you use a, a framework like this, you're going to get off to a better start. Um, and so hopefully you'll be, be able to benefit from this, you know, before you get to an MBA program, during, after, uh, for good. But I really, really like this framework. 
All right. So now I have some, some VIPs to bring up to the stage. Uh, we've got a couple of alums, a couple of current students. We're just going to have to, I'm going to have to pull some chairs up here. I don't know if we're going to take the screen down or the video down or, or not, but um, I'm going to invite our uh, special guests on up front. Um, so uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions as well as those on the live stream, but I uh, will get us started here with the first question. Uh, first question is pretty obvious. If you all from left to right uh, would uh, in just introduce yourselves and share your favorite Fuqua fun fact. If you don't know, we're really big into fun facts at Fuqua, so I'm not going to have you do 25, just one. So, Sri. Cool. Hey guys, I'm Sri. Uh, I'm from upstate New York. Uh, went to Syracuse, was a chemical engineer, graduated in 2014. Went to Fuqua in 2018. Um, my favorite fun fact, I'm at Wayfair now, my favorite Fuqua fun fact is I was the BDW co-chair with Mandy. So if you guys apply to Fuqua, get in, and then go down to Durham for admin students, we can deal out see the four new BDW coaches. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Shree. Hi, everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm from Sharon, Massachusetts, just south of the city. Went to Hamilton College in upstate New York for undergrad, studied neuroscience. Um, graduated from Fuqua last spring. I'm now at Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Patient Services. And uh, so we were actually talking about this on the ride over. She's also Vertex. And one of my fun facts is I love science fiction books, movies, Interstellar, Arrival. If you've never seen those two movies, I highly recommend them. Yes. Hi, I'm Sofia Chapiro. I'm from Argentina. I am currently at Fuqua. I'm going to start my second year in a few months. My background is in marketing, in healthcare, and a social impact accelerator. And right now, I'm doing an internship at Vertex, which is biotech. My fun fact from the list of the 23 fun facts. Or a new one. Or a new one. OK, I'll, I'll tell you something that to me is a fun fact about Fuqua. Um, I, I chose to be a call fellow which is a role one can have as a second year. You basically are a mentor to first years. Uh, so it's something one you can look forward to as a first year in terms of having the mentorship of a second year. And then if one is interested in mentoring others, uh, one can apply to be a call fellow. So I kind of went on a different direction of the typical fun fact, yeah. but yeah. Like it, awesome. So, uh, hi, I'm Vinny, I'm from Mumbai. Uh, before coming to Fuqua, I was working in EY in the performance improvement practice. Uh, I wanted to move into consulting, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm in LEK Consulting, and uh, maybe like for a new fun fact that I didn't write in my essay, uh, I, I am going to be the co-president of the Improv Club when I go back, and I've never done improv before, <laughs> so uh, it's going to be an improv act from like day one. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so Sophia mentioned she's a Cole Fellow, and uh, Vineet is a uh, Career Fellow. Um, and so those are a couple of different leadership roles you can take as second year students, both involving mentoring our first year students, but uh, we've got a ton of second years that invest in our first years to make sure they're good to go. So thank you all for, for what you do. And Sarah didn't even mention she was a co-MBAA president, so um, we got, we got uh, some, some real horsepower in the room here. BDW chair, MBAA, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, if anybody wants to jump in with a question, I am totally happy for y'all to drive this conversation. I do have one question that I'll serve up now, kind of tying back to, to my presentation, and then we'll just go uh, wherever we, what we wanna go. The question I'd love for each of you to answer, uh, you know, considering this, uh, you know, the, the, this job search journey is littered with potential road hazards or challenges, right? Um, I'd love it if each of you could isolate what was the most challenging aspect you encountered throughout this job search process and how did you overcome it? And Vineeth, I'll start with you since you've got the mic and we'll come back this way. Awesome. So uh, I think the, the, most, uh, the most challenging aspect for me was uh, everything that's not obvious. What do you do after you send that first email? What do you do after you have that first conversation? Uh, what is the best time to follow up? What is the best time to uh, to like uh, get in touch with them and like have a second conversation, or should you reach to reach out to like a third person, or are two enough? So it was just like the small details, and uh, what I was really fascinated to see, and uh, I've compared my experiences with people from other schools. Uh, Fuqua has a very very foolproof uh, methodology for recruiting. Uh, you, if you just like pay attention uh, when they're telling you stuff, they they will iron out every detail uh, 
of like the entire recruiting process and uh, not having uh, like having more context of what you should do at every point of time uh, really helped me out a lot. So, yeah. Thanks, Vineet. That the, the book I mentioned earlier, Steve Dalton wrote, his, I love the way he says it. His, his goal in life, at least in the job search uh, area, is to make the unwritten rules written. Because there are so many unwritten rules to when you reach out and when you don't and what you say and what you don't say. And so like, let's, let's stop letting them be unwritten and let's try to write them down. And that's what Vineet is talking about there. Sophia. Yes, I think my, my biggest challenge was the, the stress and the anxiety I was feeling. As an international, you, you get pressure even by your peers who are internationals who mean the best, but they're like, oh wait, you're an international. If, if you don't know, you basically have to apply um, to get sponsorship. It's a whole process. Duke has the advantage, Fugo has the advantage that you can work for three years after your MBA. But you feel a, 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 an added pressure by being an international. So between my personality and that pressure, I was feeling it. And I remember that it got to a point where, honestly, it was maybe like a week of feeling a lot of stress. But in that week, it feels like forever. So I got to the weekend and I was like, wait, like I have all these people telling me that I need to broaden and apply to other industries, not just the one I'm interested in because as an international, I need to be careful. And I was like, wait, but I kind of like get into industries that I'm not interested. How do you compete with someone who is passionate about their industry when I'm not an expert? I don't have time to get into that when I'm already getting into my industry. And so I basically did two things. First was lean into my support network, so friends, my call fellow, I reach out to my therapist, um, I, I very much try to help myself be in a calmer setting. And then I went to the CMC, uh, they are not paying me to say this, <laughs> I honestly went to the CMC. I spoke she to even them. asked me if there were yes. messages I could see through her, yes. and I was like, not taking no, the bait. No, just something to reinforce. <laughs> um, and I went to talk to, to Meg, who now got promoted to, to, to work with the alumni, but um, I went to talk to Meg, and I was like, hey, this is my situation, everyone is recommending this, what do you think? And she looked at my case and gave me concrete f recommendations, and she was like, because of your case, you don't have to, you're okay applying to these companies, don't worry, if things don't go well, well, we'll work with you. And everything she said happened. I had plenty of offers, even though I was only applying to certain companies that were my dream companies. I'm at my dream company, like, knowing that there is a network and people who have been there, who are there to support you, and then the expertise of the CMC really made a difference in how I was able to move past it and do well. Awesome. Oh, yes. Um, Along those lines, I think I struggled to maintain running my own race. And that's something that I feel like actually when your class was running our orientation, you kept saying like, run your own race, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. And I was like, yeah, 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 like I've been good at that my whole life, but no. Like the pressure of what everyone else is doing and the big shiny presentations and companies and it's very easy to forget why you came, who you are, and what you're passionate about. Um, and so that was challenging, but I, again, not being paid or asked <laughs> to say this, but I think that's what makes Fuqua's approach to the career search so unique, is that you are at the center of that. And if you graduate and are not in a role that is true to who you are and what you want and what fulfills you, like then why, why did you go to business school? You know, you need to make sure that it matches that. So it was hard, but um, I think, you know, and your story aligns with this as well, the support network that you have at Fuqua really pushes you to stay true to yourself. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say the toughest thing about recruiting is honestly just like dealing with rejection. Like you have to build a lot of resilience. I think it's one of those things where like, if you've gotten to Fuqua, like you're pretty successful in your personal professional life, you're not used to getting told no like over and over and over again. And the truth is no one bats a thousand. And so, uh, you know, no matter how good your resume is, no matter how good you are in person, like you're just, you're gonna get told no either for a first round interview or you're gonna interview with a partner and he's gonna say no. And any time in between that. Mm -hmm. And so you really just gotta like build resilience and learn that like, 
again, no one bats a thousand. And I think, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but like, that's why fit is so important at Fuqua. Cause like you have to rely on like me and my buddies, we had like a, a ritual of at any time anybody didn't get an interview, we would go out for a beer after. <laughs> like, you know, if it was Tuesday at 3 p.m., go out for a beer. And like, you know, we were being told a lot, no a lot. We're like, all right, we might have to like, slow down. <laughs> like, like batch these beer sessions. <laughs> um, but like, I think you have to find your people because your people are going to get you through recruiting. Because recruiting is just like, it is stressful. You have never been around 440 other type A really impressive people before um, who are all like going for similar types of jobs as you are and so the only way you're going to get through that is like find your people build resilience and now like the small things don't really bother me anymore because you just learn like you can't let everything bother you awesome any questions that that y'all have for the alums rising second year students i have one question yeah um at what point did you figure out what you wanted to do and like whether it was like before during your application process or when you were at Fuca that like you decided you wanted like the job that or the internship you have now. You don't all have to answer but if you've got thoughts to share, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, the, the short answer is uh, while I was considering the offers, that was when I knew exactly where to go but uh, what that meant is uh, over a period of time, uh, uh, I kept narrowing my options and uh, the, the, the entire uh, process that Sean walked us through has like a lot of soul searching and uh, you'll get to speak to a lot of people. Uh, and like eventually you'll have enough information to decide on what you don't want. So I think like the process of rejection really helped me. After I reject rejected everything I didn't want, I ended up uh, recruiting for more than one uh, career uh, paths and uh, eventually when I, I, I was I had to make the decision uh, it's sort of like through the process and through like the interviews I already knew what I wanted to do. I, I can add a when making that decision I think I think it's key to we all come to, to the MBA and have the chance to explore new horizons. I do think that if you come with a clear goal, you have a better time. It's less stressful because there's a lot to do. And if you have a million things you want to explore, you're not going to have enough time. So what I always recommend when I speak to prospective students is to speak to as many, at least current students, to understand about the different schools, to see if you feel like it's a right fit, but also to understand different industries. So if when the time starts that you, you start your MBA and you have a clear idea or at least, or at most two potential paths, it's more viable to be able to explore and you're more assertive. Otherwise, it's a lot of things to do, a lot of networking to do for multiple paths. Yeah, I mean, if I could combine those two comments, I think you'll maybe for the first time realize that time really is the most finite resource you have when you're a student because those hours get taken up pretty quickly. And so, yeah, it can be overwhelming. We're going to throw four or five employers a day at you to talk about their opportunities, right? And you, you get caught in that cycle. It can really kind of take you under. Um, so it is helpful to have a hypothesis walking in the door. I'd say it's equally helpful to, to do what Vineeth was saying. If you don't know, then be prepared to be a, a harsh critic early on. You know, an employer's goal in, in coming to talk to you for an hour at Fuqua is to sell you that their opportunity is great. If you walk out of that room unsold, they failed and it's not right for you. Don't convince yourself to keep going. And so being able to close doors, being able to determine what you don't want, like Vineet said, can be almost as helpful as figuring out what exactly you do want because you can start to narrow those, those uh, options and you know, reclaim your control of your, your time. I would, I would also say, like, don't take it that seriously. I'm sure CMC has the number of, like, 50% of people, like, move jobs after two years or something. So, like, don't look at it as, like, the short term. Like, everything you're doing is for that first job. It's an investment for a lifetime, right? So, like, if the first job is not, right? Like, I just did my two years, and I have a lot of friends who are now changing LinkedIn jobs and profiles and positions. So, like, if the first job doesn't work out, like learn and move on. You know, it's not like that first job is the be all end all. You're going to be there for the next 40 years. Yeah, there'll be a lot of transitions. Sarah, anything else to add? 
No, I think along those lines, like for me, the minute I stopped thinking about finding a career and was more about finding a job that was gonna be a stepping stone to something more, um, I've always tried to have every step be one that I knew would open several doors for me. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people moving on, right? It's like they go to a job for two years and it's opened so many more doors for them that that's kind of what they take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, what's kind of ironic about my story is I left the Air Force to gain control of my life, right? And I moved more out after the Air Force than I did in the yeah. Air Force, and the longest I've ever worked anywhere is Duke now, and it's four and a half years. Like, that's, and, and so it, exactly what Sri said, like there is a lot of transition, but that's the value of the MBA, again. It's, it's the, the skills you develop, uh, it's the exposure to the different career paths, and it's the ability to continually pivot and evolve your career, and, and that's really important to keep in mind. Other questions from the? Yes, sir. Kind of related to what we were just covering, um, what opportunities within just the normal MBA curriculum is there to concentrate in maybe two different areas or three areas? Like, uh, I think I saw on the website you could get your second major at the same time as getting your MBA. Like, if I wanted to, for example, do finance and marketing or some type, type of mix like that, what, would the, what kind of opportunities are there in the curriculum for that? I mean, academically, you certainly can, can, can get that you know, secondary concentration. And, and there's a ton of like, like the, the matrix of which courses apply to which concentrations is pretty complicated. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility within the curriculum. Are you also talking about recruiting simultaneously for multiple paths or is this more of an academic? Academic. Okay, yeah. what, what did, how did y'all feel about uh, the flexibility, the ability to, to focus on several areas through the academics? Sri, how about you to start with? Um, Academics wasn't my top priority <laughs> at school. Uh, I was there for like the recruiting aspect, the networking, like the social aspect. I don't think I got a special, like I think they call them concentrations. Yeah, I don't think I got a concentration in anything, but definitely respect if you want to do that. Um, but yeah, I just, that was, I came in knowing like, I was a buyer before business school. I was like, all right, I want to get decently good at finance and accounting, but I, that's never going to be where I want to spend my time, so. P's get degrees, so you know, if you ever hear that. <laughs> I did the HSM certificate. I'm assuming you are yeah. too. Um, I know there's obviously the finance one. I think there's marketing. You know, there, there's an it might not be an entrepreneurship academic, but some sort of focus in that yes. as well. Yes, and uh, HSM is the healthcare management. Um, healthcare health sector. Health, health sector yeah, management. Sorry. Like, end yeah. of the day, this has been a, a crazy <laughs> week for me. Uh, yeah, so there are different specializations. I, I can give this thought. I remember when I was, I, I knew I wanted to work in biotech, so to me I was like, oh, I, I already wanted to do the second year, you choose all electives. So you have a lot of flexibility in terms of choosing the electives. It's usually, I think, eight electives of, of a specific field will give you that um, additional concentration. So I knew that I was interested in healthcare, so I was gonna get the HSM certificate. Then I learned more and I learned that there's additional requirements that to me added to my learning. So I was like excited to do them and you're, you're not paying extra to do them, so I was happy. But I can tell you some um, things other people I know went through. I know someone who wanted to work in marketing after the MBA and hadn't had experience in marketing before. So for, for this person I know it was important. He felt more comfortable applying to jobs saying I have a marketing specialization. Even though someone can do seven courses in marketing, having that eighth one and being able to put it in his resume and applying and having that, I feel it's more of a confidence thing of like saying I have this specialization because you're learning and you're gonna learn it even you have the specialization or not. Um, I know other people who, I don't, I don't know if there's a finance specialization. Mm -hmm. There is, yep. okay. Yep. But I know of friends of mine who are like, I came to the MBA to strengthen my quantitative skills. So I guess she, because she's doing a lot of uh, finance electives, so I guess she's getting it. Yeah. But for some people, it's about like getting that knowledge. For others, I think it's getting that stamp on the resume. Um, on the website, there's a list of all the different options. I think that's a good point to start looking yeah, into. Yeah, I, I would say Fuqua is similar to other schools in that we're we're always trying to find the sweet spot between core required courses for everybody and let's open the door to electives as early as possible. And ultimately through that elective process, our, our goal is to make it as flexible for the students as possible. 
Um, if your goal is to take classes in ops and finance and marketing and it doesn't lead to a concentration, but that's what you desire to learn about, great. Um, honestly, you know, the, I think the, the confidence piece associated with the certification, I think there's some reality to that. I think employers aren't as concerned with what that certification is on the resume. It's not required that you have one. It's not required that you disclose one. Um, but if, if what you're seeking is the ability to learn as much about as many things as possible, I think the flexible nature of the, uh, the academic curriculum will let you do that. All right, Mandy, are there questions from the live stream? We've got lots. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. That'd be great, too. I think I probably each one is probably just from a time constraint perspective. I would say, like, maybe one of y'all answered okay. less All right. than a ton of you guys have lots of great answers, but hopefully this is helpful for those in the room, too. So I know probably we earlier we talked about, like, the toughest part of the job process or search process. So what was actually your favorite part of the search process? <laughs> I'll answer this one. Um, so I was a little bit non-traditional. Vertex does have a relationship with Duke, but I would say the vast majority of the companies, startups or mid-sized companies, were not recruiting on campus, um, not companies that other Fuquins were looking at. And reaching out to alumni with the process that I learned through the CMC and connecting with people who were really excited to hear from current Fuqua students and very rarely, if never, get outreach from them was like, like hearing their excitement about helping me and getting to connect with alumni and then also learning about these amazing companies that are interested in MBA talent was really exciting and like affirmed everything that I'd learned in the CMC process. And then also just opened my eyes to so much that could be done immediately after my MBA and for the rest of my life. Um, so, yeah. I, I will jump in because it sound, it looked bad that we all had silence um, <laughs> during the favorite, but there's, it, there are good things. Um, I would say once you realize that recruiters and alumni are not like these scary people who are evaluating you and they just want to come to campus and like shoot the shit, like talk to you, like relive their glory days at Duke and stuff like that. So that's how you make connections. Like Sean was talking the whole time about connections. Like once we all realized that when recruiters came, like they just wanted to talk about Duke basketball and like how Zion Williamson is doing and stuff like that. Like that's flipped the switch and it became a lot easier to connect with them. And you realize like you don't have to put on a show and like they're constantly evaluating you. So like it made it a lot easier. Awesome. All right, we'll hop around. So um, another one you all have probably heard about, Team Fuqua, the spirit, the culture of school a lot. So how do you all think that's kind of played into the recruitment process? Um, and maybe what are some words that recruiters use to describe Fuqua students when they're recruiting? So uh, I have a very real example. In fact, uh, uh, I wanted to just test a uh, healthcare sector and I got onto a random call because, like, why not? And uh, I, they, we started discussing really technical aspects of the healthcare sector. Uh, Sophia was with me on that call. And uh, every time uh, there was a question which I seemed, like, dumbfounded by, she sort of, like, jumped in and she, like, answered that question. Or she, like, gave, and she regularly kept giving me, like, an interval to just speak so that I can, like, show a good face myself. Uh, that's just an anecdote, but uh, I think like from day one, there's a lot of like sensitizing uh, in Fuqua, and there's like a pretty strong culture because of the things they they make us uh, go through from day one of just supporting everybody, especially during the recruiting process, and uh, it it comes out in uh, these kind of intangible ways. Anyway, we can jump back to the room if others have questions yeah. here and then I can go back. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. It seems like the recruiting process is kind of like a full-time job. So how do you compartmentalize like the recruiting process with school, with making friends, with volunteering and extracurriculars, like everything that goes on? I think actually it's a good exercise on learning how to manage different things. Uh, I remember whenever it felt hard, I would tell my friends like, okay, we're learning by doing, we're learning how to manage a busy schedule. I feel like at the end of the day, it's about priorities and about knowing yourself. 
I know I'm an introvert, so I enjoy socializing, but it drains me. So I would make choices of, I'm not gonna go out as much as other people who get energy from going out, because if not, I'm not gonna have enough energy to recruit and go to class and do the assignments in the way I like doing them. And so in certain moments of the year, I went out less, but I would still meet with friends. I would still do coffees and dinners. Um, so I, I think it's in terms of priorities. Other people are like, oh, I need to work out. Clearly I was not working out. So other people are, I need to work out, so I'm prioritizing my, my health. I'm saying in the second year, I'm gonna prioritize my health. <laughs> uh, those were always prioritizing their health. So they were like, I need to work out and I need to do my things for recruiting. And so this is how I function. Anyone else in terms of management, busy schedule? I, th I think it's just like acknowledging trade-offs, right? So <clears throat> the way we kind of thought about it was like you have recruiting, academics, and social. And like you can do two out of those three things really well. And like one is just going to fall by the wayside. That's not to say it's always going to, but like I knew recruiting and social were my priority. So if that meant Nike was on campus and there was a club that I wanted to go to and there was a cool party, I was gonna do those and then like, I'll study for finance tomorrow or something like that or maybe I'll be okay not get 100 on the quiz. Cause like going to Nike, you're, you've like incepted me. Go, going to Nike is like really my priority and like talking with them and um, you know, connecting with recruiters is gonna be, it's gonna help me accomplish my goals more than doing really well on this like finance assessment. So I think like there's trade offs, like you're not gonna be able to do everything really well and so knowing like why you're in school, why you're making this massive investment, like will help guide you. I mean, I, just one thing to add philosophically, I think one of the most soul crushing things about the job search is it can be infinite. You could literally spend every minute of your time worried and consumed by this job search. And again, part of the reason we wanna put recipes in front of students and establish rules is to make an infinite process finite. Let's not spend two hours working on a pitch. Let's spend just five minutes and go. Let's not reach out to 100 people. Reach out to five and go to the bar. Like, let's set some clear rules so you know what you have to do now and when you don't have anything else to do, go do something that's fun. Um, and so our, our job is to try and, you know, make this thing a little bit more finite. Yeah, that's it. This is more to, to the alums. Coming out of it, what is one thing that you didn't get to do that you maybe heard from current students or prospective students that you wished you were able to do if you could go back and, and do the two years again? I wish I took advantage of Big Duke more. Um, there are so many amazing things, and I work in healthcare, and like Duke Health is just, I mean, at the forefront of everything. Um, there's undergrads who are starting million dollar companies while they're at Duke. I'm like, who are you? This is, this is so cool. Um, and so, I mean, I'll, I'll be totally frank. It was COVID for a good chunk of my time there. And so I have, I have a lot of wish lists that you all get to do, which I'm so happy for you and all that. Um, but yeah, I am like, now that I'm removed from just even just academia, like I wish, I wish I went to that really cool talk instead of sitting on my couch and petting my cat for that hour that afternoon. I don't know. Like all those little things build up. I, I really took for granted how amazing it is to be part of such an amazing university community. Yeah, I would, I would just echo that, like stepping out of your comfort zone. This is, I think somebody mentioned like, you know, you're gonna work for 40 years. This is a two year break where you can be with other like-minded, super curious people. Like why not? I think a lot of things I did um, at school, like, were things that I was good at. Like, I took a lot of communication classes. I did a lot of orientation work. I, I, I enjoy that stuff, but I didn't go to the speakers in nonprofit or healthcare because that just, like, wasn't my background. I knew I wasn't going to do that, but, like, we have awesome speakers who come. Um, and, you know, now that I work 50 hours a week, that's not going to happen anymore and <laughs> stuff like that. So, really, like, take these two years and, like, step out of your comfort zone, and especially once you get the offer and, like, your brain shuts off and now you can like do literally whatever you want, I would say do that. Yeah. All right, so Manny, time check, 7.45. Like, how do you want to wrap this? Yeah. Well, I do want to do one more question here only because like four people bask it in a okay. slightly different way. So yep. I'd love to, to ask at least one or two more from here. Uh, and then we'll kind of just do some general networking. We have lovely snacks back here and move that direction. But um, yeah, so question kind of asked here is, 
Can you tell a little bit more about how um, the clubs really tied into your recruiting and networking process? And I would think that would obviously tie most into our professional clubs, but how they kind of complement the CMC probably. I have a good story. Or you yeah, can go. yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Um, so I ended up at Vertex because of the healthcare club, 100%. Um, so Vertex is a pharmaceutical biotech company. Um, if you had told me, even honestly, six weeks into Fuqua that I was going to end up here, I would have laughed at you. <laughs> um, that was not my intention at all. I was interested in digital health, thought I was going to end up at a digital health startup. But uh, they did, Healthcare Club did a week in cities in Boston for healthcare. And I remember the day so clearly. It was rainy, it was the end of the day. We were going to Vertex. I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, I do not want to work in pharma. Why do I have to go to this presentation? <laughs> and within seconds was just struck by the culture of Vertex. I, I, this is not a presentation for Vertex, so I won't go into it. If you want to talk <laughs> about it later, we can. Um, but I fell in love with it and was like, this is my dream company. They were doing digital innovation. It was such a good fit. And so um, I think you talked earlier about opening your eyes to things that you wouldn't have considered. And um, here I am and now trying to bring more Fuquins on board. There's another one of us there too. And so um, the, yeah, I mean, the healthcare club opened my eyes and I tell a story often of how I would have never ended up where I was super happy if it wasn't for that day in the rain. When I think from a CMC perspective of, of just how do you, effectively do the things that they're talking about for specific sectors of interest. I can't, I can't do that broadly in a classroom setting to 400 students, right? It, does, it would not make sense for me to subject 80% of the room to a Vertex presentation when only 20% are interested in healthcare, right? So what we focus on in the classroom are things like fit that everybody needs, but then we realize that the most effective way to deliver sector-specific stuff is through the clubs. So I'm not, as a career coach, gonna try and recreate that. Instead, I'm gonna partner with my club. So I work with the marketing club and I work with the GM club. And the students lead the way, uh, but we're there as partners to provide the support that they need. Um, but those, we, we couldn't do what we do without the clubs. They're, they're doing a lot of that sector-specific stuff just because it's the most efficient and effective model. I, I can add a, a bit about the club. So basically, in every club, there's gonna be someone organizing those trips to certain hubs where there's going to be a company presentations and you're going to get to experience what that company is like. They also organize sessions on all the steps the CMC explains of the roadmap of this is how you uh, do a cover letter, this is how you do an email, this is all of those things. We do a double click specific for the industry. So it helps and it's all run by the second years. So the second years are explaining to the first years what they experienced very recently cater specific to the industry. Then they, there's also organization of mock interviews, there's coaching, there's all these different things that the second years supplement to the work the CMC does in order to help in a very like guided way the first years as they go through this path. Awesome. Anything else? Yeah, for, I just want to say for those um, online that didn't get to all the questions, reach out to our office. We'll connect you with the, the appropriate folks. Um, and I want to make sure, too, I know this is obviously a very um, career-focused evening, but if some of you do have admissions questions, I've connected with a few of you individually over the last few months. Um, but if you do, like, use this next time. Ask me, ask the students, alumni. Uh, we're happy to talk about the admissions process, too. We'll do that a little bit more informally while y'all enjoy coffee, snacks, um, but we'll be around. So come up, ask me those questions. Um, and then to those online, thank you again for joining us in one of our first uh, hybrid on-the-road admissions events. We really appreciate it, and um, we hope to see you all on campus very soon. We are open for campus visits moving into the fall, so check the website, and we'd love to have you come down. Awesome. Thank you so much for our panelists. Uh, just, uh, you know, somebody asked about Team Fuqua. I didn't really work closely with any of the four up here on the stage. I mean, maybe peripherally, I, I met them a couple of times, but 
they immediately said yes to the email that I sent asking if they'd participate. So I think that's testament uh, to the culture of the program. So thank you all for, for taking time out of your Wednesday night to, to be here tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Um, and we, like, uh, like Manny said, we'll break, we'll hang out, and there you guys can network and ask questions. Um, but thanks so much for being here. Have a good night. Thanks.